New York, New York is what everyone thinks when they roll out of their gate overlooking the beautiful city skyline at Newark Liberty International. Likewise in Philly, rushing to snap a photo at the top of those stairs. Something something New Jersey has the better bagels and cheesesteaks, yada yada. While all of that is arguably true, it also serves up all the history and fondness without any of the self-reverence. It's just here, living, breathing. Change is inevitable and welcomed. Jersey doesn't lament the past with rose-tinted glasses. The world is just different right now. And in New Jersey, that characteristic of the world has always been embraced. It's always been who we are. COVID-19 pulled the rug out from under roughly 750,000 people last year, driving the unemployment rate to 15% in the state. We have a new way of hanging out with friends, of grocery shopping, of going to the movies. The restaurant and small business sector was decimated in April of 2020. Many shops closed altogether, and some did what Jersey is known for. We'll take a look at a handful of restaurants around New Jersey who did weather the storm. They took all the blows and did it their way. I'm Paul Vagianos, and I'm the owner of It's Greek To Me. We are busier now than we were before the pandemic. I built this restaurant 25 years ago. My family has been in the restaurant business my whole life. I decided that this is something I wanted to do. After marrying my wife and having my children, it's the best thing I've ever done in my life. Somewhere around the second week in March, the governor closed the dining rooms in all restaurants in New Jersey. I closed my dining room the week before. I was well positioned for this because I was a germaphobe before the pandemic began. So we shut down the dining room. We did takeout and delivery only. We lined up the takeout and delivery bags at the front of the restaurant. And we were busier uh, with takeout and delivery than we were with the dining room open. In July, I knew it's gonna get cold soon. I won't seat a customer there if I won't seat my own children there. They expect that I'm gonna provide them with safe dining options. I built one of these with a, uh, an electric heater that is somewhere on the roof here. We lobbied the governor and the State Department of Health, and two weeks later, the governor issued an executive order saying that this is the way the Department of Health wants people to eat, individualized, that is disinfected after every meal and that we blow out with a garden blower just to clear the air. In the last 25 years, I have had a lot of different ideas. Some kind of good, some not so good. This was, I mean, you know, the, there, there are lines to get into these. I serve food the way I like it. Fortunately, a lot of people like food the way I like it. They like the way we serve it. Um, they like what we do. And this is just that same philosophy in, in a crisis situation. I watched my, my father who was in the restaurant business. He loved to serve people. And I became my father. I didn't want to, I didn't expect to, but I am the living embodiment of that man. He was in the dining business forever. My father was, was an illegal immigrant when he got here and he washed dishes and worked seven days a week for a dollar a day. And then at one point, he gathered enough money with a couple of guys. They took over a place that had gone out of business and they ran it. He was still illegal. Eventually, he became a citizen. But my father, who was the smartest man I ever met in my whole life and the hardest working son of a bitch who ever came to America, he was the American dream. I look forward to the day when I can go back to greeting my, my, my clientele, giving them hugs, shaking hands, asking them how the family is, like, like we always do. Because we follow each other's lives over the years. We provide them with a safe place to go to get out of the house where they don't even leave the house to go to work anymore. You know, we're really trying to cater to what they need. And, and the village of Ridgewood has evolved. They see that this is a crisis and that if they don't work with us, then the entire central business district won't survive. 
But we have been able to help a lot of people adapt to the new situation. Everyone is one with this. While Paul and his team had success utilizing outdoor space for seating cabin feverish patrons in the dead of winter, a small town about an hour south of it didn't have that luxury. Meet the Summit Diner, a train spot gem. Being a staple of Jersey since 1929, the small time joint moved from its Elizabeth homestead to Summit in 1938. Jim Greberis has been behind the counter since 1980. We used to be busy early in the morning, you know, people commuting. Now they kind of cut down a lot because Nobody's working uh, in the city anymore. Is there any way we can cut that? I have to take some money to just this season. Sorry, bud. And when I say behind the counter, I mean it. The majority of the people that come in here, we have a lot of uh, Summit families. We have families from all over, but, you know, people taking the train. Now they kind of cut down a lot since uh, everybody's working from home. But we still do, thank God, we still do our fair share. I had to cut back a little bit on my staff. We don't do as much food as we used to, like, you know, prepping for dinner because we cut down dinner. We don't really do any, like, you know, we used to do dinner specials. I'm still doing soups and everything else, but stuff that I can prep easier and not waste. Uh, breakfast, thank God, yeah, that's our big, that's our big thing. Breakfast. Yeah, it's, it's our main. Through the years, it's become our main. Indeed, thank God for breakfast. The morning meal is a $10 billion industry that makes up most of diner traffic. Because who can resist the simple, quick pleasures of a pork roll, egg, and cheese sandwich? I go after habits. The thing is, people now are staying home. They don't travel as much. Summit is usually, you know, have, has a lot of foot traffic. That kind of cut down a lot, so that's what I'm hoping will change when everything opens up. Because people were staying home, they got used to being home, and people are creatures of habit. They form a habit. It's it's hard to you know to break the habit and start moving around again. I see that you know around Christmas time, after Christmas, which is our busiest time, January, February, it slows down, and of course everybody's dieting, and it takes a while for everybody to get back into moving around. So now with a full year of people being home. I'm just wondering how long it's gonna take for everything to go to somewhat normal. The snow melted, the flowers bloomed. What would typically feel like a period of rebirth held an air of uncertainty now. COVID-19 vaccines rolled out, but most of the businesses who couldn't weather the cold months didn't return in the spring. Those who did, the winter caterpillars, broke out of their pandemic cocoons forever changed. So my name is Jack Wright and I'm the owner of Exit Zero, which is a publishing company and a restaurant and a retail store. In 2003, we started Exit Zero magazine, which is a weekly magazine, which was aimed at visitors and also locals as well. So I was a, I was a journalist in Scotland and then London and I worked um, in national newspapers. I got headhunted to come to New York to launch a men's magazine. And after four years of being in New York, I I was kind of getting tired of corporate magazines and the corporate world in general. And I quit my job in New York and I emailed my friend and I said, hey, I'm available for the summer. What should I do? And he said, why don't you come down and, and run my pool bar? And uh, I was like, okay, never worked in the hospitality business in my life, but sure. I kind of got the motivation to, to launch a weekly magazine for Cape May. And so I stayed here. I didn't think I was going to, but I stayed here, launched the magazine and and then it just kind of grew arms and legs. And I think if you told me in Scotland that this is where I would end up, I'd be like, how could that possibly happen? But life's funny that way, you know? When a door opens, you should go through it. And then 2015, we opened a restaurant because there wasn't anything within 40 miles that was selling Indian and Thai curries, which is my favorite food. So we opened Exit Zero Cookhouse. And then 2018, uh, a group of local investors built what is now Exit Zero Filling Station and we moved their restaurant, a retail, and our publishing offices into this building. I'm from Scotland originally, and um, the most popular food is, is curry. British people eat curry like Americans eat pizza. So we wanted to do, this kind of feels like a roadside, you know, gas station feel. So we had a classic American stuff. We did, you know, we tried to do really good burgers and I think we've succeeded. We have a Bollywood burger, which is an Indian style burger. 
we have an amazing fried chicken sandwich, which again, I think is classic Americana. So it, it works in its own kind of crazy, you know, way it, it works, you know? The, 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 we, get, we get reviews sometimes from people saying, this place doesn't make any sense, but I love it. And I'm okay with that. So we, I guess we had two choices. Um, like at the beginning of March, we don't feel safe having people in our restaurant. We don't think it's the right thing to do. We want to stay open, of course we do. We want to keep paying our rent. We want to keep paying our employees. So we thought, what can we do? We'll do takeout. And then in the summer, we didn't have outdoor dining. We had a gas station out there. But again, we thought, okay, outdoor dining happened middle of June, we have to survive. So we got permission from the local authority and the state to sell alcohol outside. And we kind of uh, closed off our gas pumps and created the, the, the gas pump tiki bar. We put down like fake grass and some solar powered tiki torches. And that went great. And then when the cold weather came in, we thought, well, it's still outdoor dining, what can we do? So we actually purchased a bunch of 10 by 10 pop-up tents. And uh, we initially had a Christmas village where we rented them to local retailers. And then when Christmas ended, we had this idea to convert them into little ski tents. And then we converted three old trailers that we bought online and turned them into private dining pods. And those have just exploded. The Airstream trailer we're actually renting into August, 2022 so people are going crazy for them. People say, you know, brands should be storytelling. I've been a journalist my whole life and this whole company started um, as a magazine. The common threads are that we tell stories about ourselves and, you know, we tell stories about the community. Um, we, we have a lot of engagement with the community. We do a lot of programs, you know, we do a thing called Feed Our Friends where we give a free meal. It started because of the pandemic. We would have our uh, community nominate a family every week and we go and we, we bring along a meal for four and we deliver it to them. I think it inspires other people to do it. We like that we can make a difference like that. And feeding people is a pretty basic thing, right? You know, we could give away free t-shirts. <laughs> it's not quite the same. You know, having someone deliver a, a bottle of wine or a four pack of beer and some curries and burgers, that's awesome. <laughs> Two hours up the coast was pretty much the same deal, with added pressure. Asbury Park, the pride and joy of New Jersey, home of the East Coast music factory, the Stone Pony, land of the college bar hopper, the mix of its counterculture rock and roll roots and the gentrified 20-something populace that roam the streets during summer nights may seem disjointed, but it's a perfect microcosm of the universe, demonstrating that alcohol, some music, and sitting on a dark, vacant beach can induce inebriated harmony. Asbury has a lot of bars, but the ones that prevail are those that lean into their specialty, their appeal. And what do you stumbling bar hoppers and punk rockers mosey on into the beer garden for? Mostly it's the craft beers, the international selection that we have, the food, especially the giant pretzel. Ah, the giant pretzel. Cities like Asbury Park thrive on a communal experience. You know, you could come in with like a group of 15, and other times you were like sitting next to complete strangers, and all of a sudden you end up having conversations with random people. And the rooftop, just hanging out, drinking in the sun and things like that. And we wanted to try to stay open as long as we could, but the minute we could get, you know, back up and running, we had, you know, we knew we were coming back strong again. So we uh, redid the rooftop, you know, sanded it down, made it look brand new, nice pretty facelift. And when we opened, we, we hit the ground running like strong. We were like really busy when we opened up. But once the summer passes at the beach, it gets cold. So the beer garden took a cue from their own playbook igloos and the town followed suit we had every intention of going out strong in uh, november and uh when it's happened i went to the town asked them if we could put more up because of what was going on they absolutely they told us and we got as many as we could up there and we just took extra precautions inside the igloo so we spaced out 15 minute gaps in between each reservation so we can sterilize and sanitize before the next party came in the city of asbury played a crucial part in the commercial success of the area advising and encouraging businesses along the way. That, in turn, created a fluid relationship between businesses, an almost altruistic endeavor to help each other. Almost altruistic, because while they weren't ordered to help each other, they knew everyone needed to pitch in if the town was going to survive the winter. Everybody tried to do everything they could, like, say together. The town has been really accommodating to everybody, you know, allowing them to close Cookman Avenue down, allowing them to use it for tables and streets, and then in the wintertime, allowing them to put up like the, the bubbles and the igloos and greenhouses. So the town's been really good to assist the other businesses. All the other businesses helping each other out. So like we'll tell people, you know, if we're on the wait, 
go next door to the distillery. You know, if you want to give uh, Cookman Avenue a try, Bonnie Reed, or one of those places, you know, uh, trying to encourage people not to leave Asbury Park, but if we're full and we're at capacity, hey, you can, we have these other places up, you know, not even a block away. So it, it, we've been helping each other out as best we can. Telling paying customers to visit a competitor, the pandemic really has changed all of us, perhaps for the better. Maybe all those comic books were right after all. That altruism actually helps us thrive. A 45 minute drive north, where New Jersey ditches the sand for pizza parlors shoved against pawn shops and delis on every corner. Their neon signs and chain of beacons carrying the news of freshly baked bread. While that may be a bit too romantic of a phrase, one bakery aspired to manifest that prose. My name's Rachel Wyman. I'm the owner and head baker at Montclair Bread Company, um, a small retail community bakery. My grandmother made wedding cakes for a living, and um, I was raised by a single mom. So I spent most of my time at my grandmother's house while my mom was working. And um, my grandma would give me a bag of buttercream and a paper plate to decorate while she was decorating the cakes. I learned to write my name in buttercream before I could hold a pencil. So I enrolled at the Culinary Institute of America. And the very first day, I just fell in love with this process of baking bread because there was a soulfulness about it that's really lost when you're just making a special occasion cake. I realized that by baking bread, I could be a part of my community every day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I just really wanted to find a place where I could grow roots and create a space that people wanted to be in, that people felt was an extension of their home, um, where they could go to be met with you know, a friendly face, a familiar face and meet other people there, kind of like, um, I don't know, an intersection. And, and so that's what I still strive to create with Montclair Bread Company. The Congregation Hall of Pastries, a type of experience that would typically come to a halt amidst a worldwide pandemic. Well, it, it changed everything and it was also very much the same. My goal as a, as a business owner didn't change. Um, I wanted to provide the community with what they needed. There wasn't a supply issue, there was a supply chain issue. So I had no issues getting all of the, you know, fruits, vegetables, flour, yeast. I could get everything from my vendors um, that people needed. And so the grocery stores couldn't keep their shelves stocked, but I could keep those things in stock here and create a safe environment because I have this great outdoor space where people can come and pick up and not have to enter a building. Um, so that, that's what I did. We quickly became kind of an artisan bodega. Milk, butter, eggs, flour, you know, all of these things that we could get. We got everybody toilet paper, milk, eggs, whatever they needed, fresh vegetables, and everybody took that from here. So I supported them, they supported me, and we all supported our community through that time. One of the things that became very clear to me during the pandemic is how far my voice reaches. Um, and by my voice, I mean, you know, the people that read the emails that come from Montclair Bread Company, the social media followers, you know, all of that. I, I have this huge platform. So I decided that I wanted to use it to the best of my ability. My kids are really struggling um, with virtual school and feeling isolated and anxious and all of the things that you hear. And so I wanted to create something that would get my kids engaged in learning and connect them with all the other kids in Montclair who are experiencing the same things. The solution? Montclair Kids News Project, a newspaper written by local elementary and middle school students during the pandemic. Inside the paper are individual experiences that the youth from around Montclair could tell in their own words. Stories cover an eclectic mix, from the video chatting lifestyle to NFL predictions and even backyard archeological digs. Reading through the paper, it strangely and inversely echoes the early days of the internet, where your daily browsing included seeing fun animations, cool discoveries, 
and unadulterated passion for the community. There were a ton of parents involved that made it happen, and then we raised money for the printing. I think we printed like a thousand copies of the paper and handed it out at all the schools and at the bakery. There was a big distribution event. Because of the pandemic and because I was able to, to have this outreach into the community, I think we connected and unified a much more diverse group of people and it's super exciting to see and you know it's like everything that I dreamt this business could be. I just want it to be accessible and feel safe for everyone. As 2021 ticked down to its final moments, ringing in a hopefully brighter new year, the coronavirus had other plans. New variants of the virus, new masks, newfound caution. There's an ebb and flow to time and circumstance right now. The world is still different, and we're learning how to live with something that isn't as fleeting as some thought. But all things come to an end, and all we can choose is what to do with our time here, together. People are looking for the right things. We need people to have fun again. These five restaurants, these aren't the only ones. This group is just a sample of the greatness spawned from such dark times. In a time where keeping distance from each other was necessary, these people built on that disconnect, built on that in spite of it, and strengthened their community, little by little. A tribe, a family, a community. Let's unite everyone and tell our stories. New Jersey, New Jersey. I know it doesn't have the same ring to it, but that's always been kind of our thing. Jersey doesn't have the Empire State Building. It doesn't have the Liberty Bell, but it has people people who care. We may sound abrasive all the time, but we are individuals who give a damn.